Well, you see on the screen another aerobic test, a low intensity aerobic test at about 75% of FTP for a one hour effort. And Ed likes to chuck these in because it gives him a good understanding as to how my aerobic fitness is progressing. It's very important that you do these as a nice steady state, low intensity effort over the duration of an hour. Ed's going to explain on screen now what he's looking for. Um, yeah, basically that ride, although it was a very low intensity, it was, I was just looking at like one, uh, the power and heart rate ratio or relationship, and then two, the efficiency factor. Um, relatively low intensity for this particular test, but tells, tells us a lot. Your efficiency factor for that one hour test was 1.49. And I've got a couple of examples here. Um, so what we likely see developing your base, because you've never really developed a base before, you know, you've only been cycling like this for a year. Um, but using zone two aerobic threshold workouts in early base period, we could see like if we test if we test quite regular, you could see like an improvement here or there, but we test like every three or four weeks. Uh, but some examples could include like you'd start at 1.63 um, as an efficiency factor and it could get up to 1.9, 1.8, which would be like really good. But the idea would be like just to raise it to a point where it starts to plateau and level off. And then that was when that is when we'd know that um, we'd have to shift gears to do something else. Uh, using sweet spot, for example, or, or tempo, that could be the next level up. And given that you'll be doing, you know, Marmot and you want to go uh, to Europe and do a couple of the long climbs next year, um, that makes perfect sense. Um, the power and heart rate relation, they say like a gold standard is usually below 5%. Um, obviously, it depends what power output you're trying to hold but yours was 5.15. I mean, that's pretty much five, isn't it? 5%. So like, as far as that effort for one hour is concerned, um, 5%, I mean, you're pretty bang on there. I mean, you'd likely see that drop, but I mean, it's a great starting point. So just starting the warm up ahead of the one hour effort. And as Ed touched on, what he's looking for from this one hour, nice steady state controlled test is for progression on the data from last time around. In particular, the efficiency factor, that's a measure of your normalized power divided by your average heart rate over the effort. And that, if it's improving, I'm moving from 1.49% last time towards 1.9%, that's gonna indicate improved aerobic capability. And it'll be used as a kind of a measure for Ed as to when he increases the intensity of this test, i.e. moves to sweet spot or something like that, as he said. Similarly, he's looking at the power to heart rate ratio, because that's a measure of how the heart rate reacts to a steady, controlled power effort. And as Ed said, gold standard, 5% or less, therefore I'm looking for an improvement of 5.15% last time down towards five. I'll report back at the end of the test with the data. 11 and a half minutes into the effort. Heart rate has been in the 133 to 137 range. It came down a tad after the beginning, especially when I stopped talking. in the 141 to 143 range. Just under a minute to go.
into the cool down, then we'll look at the data. Well, a very quick perusal of the training peaks data, highlighting here the one hour aerobic test, indicates that throughout the test, my heart rate kind of crept up from the low to mid 130s to around about 142, 143 at a 30 minute marker, and then up as high as about 145, 146 before creeping back down in the low um, 140s. So that's a good thing. Um, unfortunately, I undercut the power a little bit. I was only 216 watts average power versus target of 220. I didn't use the ERG mode, but it shouldn't matter too much because power to heart rate and efficiency factor are both measures of aerobic capability relative to average power, or average normalized power. And both show a little bit of improvement, 2.6% power to heart rate. That's a good thing. It's down from 5.15% to 2.6%. And the efficiency factor has crept up a tad from 1.49% to 1.54%. So a little bit of improvement there. And I guess that's not unexpected. I'd kind of evidence a little bit of improvement during all those base miles or the festive 500, but also the endurance training that Ted's had me doing has certainly also evidenced improved kind of heart rate throughout the training and recovery when there's these surges and then little periods of recovery at tempo. So, you know, fingers crossed, this is boding well. So for me personally, strength training is integral to good body composition, i.e. lower body fat. Yes, Strength training will build a bit of muscle, or certainly for the cyclist that's doing a lot of KMs on the bike, help preserve muscle and maybe build a bit of muscle very slowly. It's great for engendering good movement patterns, flexibility, bone density, and all of that prevents against injury and builds a little bit of power and strength that translates to the bike. But from the perspective of body composition, Strength training provides a nice little cross training benefit to complement the cycling. You burn a few calories during the training, but also because it's very anaerobic in nature, you burn calories for up to 24 hours after the training's over. And that's a good thing. And if you put a bit of muscle on over the medium to long term, again, that's helpful. Muscle will help the body raise its met metabolic rate and improve the capability of the body to turn food and carbohydrates into energy, i.e. to metabolize carbohydrates, improve insulin sensitivity. So for me, strength training is integral to health, fitness, athletic performance, but also reducing the body fat. So we're gonna explore that in a little bit more detail in the vlog. Now currently across the UK and many parts of Europe, we're in national lockdown. So most of us don't have access to a gym. And I'm guessing most of you don't have access to even an Olympic bar or a trap bar in order to deadlift from the comfort of your own home. But fear not. On Sunday, when I've got a little bit more time, I'm gonna show a few moves just to improve flexibility and then demonstrate some really nice body weight movements so that we can get into the groove of strength training such so when the gym's open or we have access to dumbbells or other gym equipment, we're much better able to execute a nice strength training program that's complementary to the cycling. However, today I'm going to complement the deadlift with the press up. Now, I personally love the press up when I don't have access to a gym because it works multiple muscle groups at the same time. The core is worked very, very heavily, as obviously are the arms, in particular the triceps, and obviously the pectoral muscles are worked really hard as well. And because it's a compound movement, that means um, the energy expended for each repetition of the press up is high and therefore you get a good calorie burn both during the training and long after it's over. Well this is variant number one of the press up and it's the easiest variant and it's a great place to start if you haven't been undertaking strength training or are not used to press ups for quite some time. But fear not, if you persist with these and get to a position where you're completing three to four sets of 15 to 20 reps then you're going to be good to progress on to variant number two that makes the movement a little bit harder. Now the reason this is the easiest variant is because unlike the conventional press up where we're up on our toes throughout and that places a lot more weight on the upper torso and requires more core involvement to complete each rep, here for this easiest variant we're going to be on our knees throughout. But it does create a really nice mind muscle connection, gets the body used to working in this movement pattern and sets it up nicely to progress on to variant number two. So we start with our hands just outside of shoulder width apart. We try and place 
a little bit of pressure inwards with the palms to almost try and squeeze them together without the hands actually moving. As I say, we stay on our knees throughout. We take a deep breath in through the mouth and the nose in order to get air into the core and tense the abs. And then we extend down, keeping our elbows at a 45 degree angle to the torso. And then we squeeze the pectoral muscles and extend upwards fully like that. And we squeeze the pecs at the top and then down. And then by pushing the kind of palms together at the bottom of the movement, that really emphasizes the mind muscle connection and fires up the pectoral muscles um, in order to initiate the movement. As I say, aiming for three to four sets of 15 to 20 reps. And when you can complete three sets of 15 to 20 reps on variant one, we're ready for variant two. Hands raised up off the floor on a little chest like this, up on our toes, therefore there's more core involvement, but because we're raised off the ground, it takes a little bit of the weight off the upper torso and makes the movement a little bit easier. And when you can complete three sets of 15 or 20 reps on variant two, we're ready for the conventional press up. Hands flat on the ground, up on our toes, more weight on the upper torso now, more core involvement as follows. And I recommend pairing these with the lower body exercises I'm just about to demonstrate, albeit I do happen to demonstrate those lower body exercises on a different day. At home, there's plenty we can do using just our body weight to create a nice strength and power adaption, but also good movement patterns and build a bit of flexibility. And with flexibility in mind, it's good to warm up before you hit a squat variant or indeed a deadlift variant with a little stretch as follows, just to ease the muscles a little bit. So we stand up, feet shoulder width apart, toes pointing slightly out, and we get our hands just outside the edge of our foot, elbows inside the knees, pushing out against the knees, and we try and sit on our heels. And what you'll find is that you initially lack the flexibility to hinge at the hip. But fear not, if you keep pushing out with the elbows and keeping the knees out over the toes, gradually the hip flexors ease up a little bit and you can kind of sink down. And we're trying to get the chest up and the back nice and straight. You won't be able to do that initially, so don't force the movement. Just keep putting nice gentle pressure out on the knees here, trying to keep the knees out over the toes using the elbows. And gradually you'll feel the muscles ease up a little bit. And I'm trying to go at an angle here so you can see both foot angle, knee angle, but also back straight, chest up. And gradually the muscles just ease up until you can have a nice upright position and you kind of sat on your haunches sat on your heels such that it feels quite comfortable to do this now it does take a little bit of time to kind of build up this flexibility but persevere with it because flexibility is integral to all the lower body strength exercises and it's great for preventing against injury well, when you're sitting in the office in a fixed position or indeed on a bike in a fixed position. Flexibility is the friend of the health enthusiast, sorry. So starting with the easiest variant of the squat. Feet just over shoulder width apart, toes pointing slightly out, chest up, shoulders back, deep breath in through the mouth and the nose, air into the core, tighten the core, Get your elbows up and your arms up as follows. And then we descend down, squeezing the glutes and the hamstrings, keeping the knees out over the toes until we go as low as we can. Knees here nicely over the toes, keeping the air in the core, pushing against the abs. We get to hopefully just below parallel here. You can see hamstring below parallel. Nice straight back, chest up. And then we extend up with squeezing the glutes and the hamstrings. Full extension of the quads, squeeze the quads. Deep breath in through the mouth and nose, get that core tight and back down again for a little pause of one, two, squeeze the glutes and the hamstrings and back up. One, two. And when you can get to, I guess, 15 to 20 reps of just your body weight, you're good to go for variant number two. And variant number two simply adds a nice jump in order to initiate the movement upwards, making it explosive, great transfer across to the bike as follows. 
One, two. Aiming for eight to 10 reps like that. Now, when you get to a place where you can complete three sets of 15 to 20 reps of variant one, or eight to 10 reps of variant two, you're probably good to add some weight. Now, if you don't have dumbbells or a kettlebell at home, um, as didn't I um, during the first lockdown, you can improvise a kettlebell using a carrier bag and some books. I've done that in the past if you check out previous vlogs. Um, focus here is exactly the same as the first two variants. Feet just outside of shoulder width apart, shoulders back, chest up, elbows up nice and high, deep breath in through the mouth and nose, get that core tight, descend down, count of one, sitting on the haunches, or one, two, sitting on the haunches, and then extend up and push through the hips. And through with the hips for the full extension, squeeze the quads. And we're looking for a nice, powerful movement. And we're always stopping the movement when the speed upward slows. Because what we're not trying to do is overly fatigue the muscles because the strength training here should be accretive to what we're doing on the bike. We're going to create power and strength, a bit of flexibility and good movement patterns. We're not trying to create lots and lots of muscle damage and so much fatigue in the legs that we can't train on the bike later. The edit is going down, but we've got something else almost as magnificent as Jane in full edit to share with you. I present. Pre-way swaying. Well, I just completed a race on the UCI Wells course at Innsbruck, including two ascents of the four KOM, two leg snappers, about a thousand meters of climbing, or Zwift meters of climbing, 48 kilometers. And look, you can see here, got my best ever power over an hour and 20 minutes. Super happy with that, 271 average, about 285 normalized. And when we look at the timeline, you can see a really pretty power curve, um, you know, starting really with the first ascent, we had to dig very deep, got dropped from the first group, and then a nice little threshold effort or a little bit above threshold, for the first ascent, a little leg snapper, a bit of R&R &R in the middle here, and then a lovely second ascent, again, um, just north of 300 watts average, I would as assume, and then a final little TT, um, another leg snapper, and then, for me, a sprint finish on the way in for P13, but I was super happy with P13, there's a lot more, there's, there's many more strong riders than I in a team vegan Tofu Tornado race, but um, definitely feeling, I guess, the benefits, Ed's saying, of having had um, lower intensity during a festive 500, you've got to ride slow to go fast, starting to really understand that, but also psychologically feeling the benefit of some of Ed's kind of tempo with surge training, which I think has definitely given me more confidence to push a little bit deeper um, into zone six and then recover at sort of zone two or three. Just drink that in. <laughs> 